Welcome to this lovely webinar between Sound Exchange and Symphonic Distribution. My name is Steve Lewis. I am director of UGC and video here at Symphonic and work closely with uh, Sound Exchange. And we're happy to have Mark Rucker and Tiara Guy here today from Sound Exchange to answer many of our questions and give us a lovely presentation about Sound Exchange itself and its many facets. Um, just a brief intro here. Um, we handle distribution of catalogs to all kinds of DSPs, including Sound Exchange, which not everybody participates in, but we would highly suggest it. It's a great platform for a collection of digital performance royalties in the US and internationally, they collect other types of royalties as well. And if you haven't looked into it with your catalogs, uh, it is advisable to do so. There could be lots of opportunities there for you to get uh, missing royalties that maybe you're not even thinking about. Uh, also, they have a robust neighboring rights um, option, and they also represent artists, the artist side of things. Now, we as a distributor, uh, we're solely representing the sound recording side, but there's a whole other side to sound exchange that uh, represents the artist and performer side. So if you are an artist or a performer, there could be uh, lots of revenue waiting in hiding for you somewhere out there in the platforms. So I'm going to turn it over to who wants to go first? Mark, you want to go first? Say a few words. Yeah, that'll be me. Um, yeah, I, Steve, that was great. I think we can just call it good now. OK, uh, yeah, we're done. We're done. Yeah. No, no, no. I uh, no. Obviously, a lot of what you said is, is totally true and totally accurate. Um, but to to give a little background, I I come from the the industry management space. I was an artist management for fifteen years, and just getting familiar with these types of tools for artists and the rights owners, and whether you're independent or on a label, all of them matter. And Sound Exchange is a great tool to be a part of. And it's again, it's like essentially free to use as the artist. It's important to get signed up and 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 claim your songs, just like you wouldn't leave you know money on the table anywhere else. This is that's what we're here for is to make sure you're getting all the royalties that you're earning, and that is an important piece. But um, but yeah, I, I'm based here in Nashville, and I'm on the industry relations team. And uh, T, do you want to do a quick intro before we jump in? Sure. Um, <clears throat> just to piggyback on that, thanks, Steve. Thanks for having us today. We're excited to do this and you know, teacher members and others more about sound exchange and, you know, how to use our tools, how to maximize royalty collections. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been with sound exchange for almost 13 years. So I'm just happy to always, you know, help, help the artists and help the business and make sure things are as smooth as possible and that you're collecting everything you're due. So with that, Mark, kick it yes. off. Yes. So, um, uh, so just to start, I want to kind of put us all on the same page. Steve gave us like a really good overview of like what exactly does Sound Exchange do. Um, if we go to the next slide, we can kind of see where Sound Exchange is at. So Sound Exchange has been around for 20 years, so since 2003, and since then we've collected and distributed over 10 billion dollars to creators and rights owners, which is no small amount of number. That's a very significant chunk of change for the uh, the recorded music industry. Nearly last year, a uh, billion dollars alone last year. We, we work with over 650,000 creators. That includes performers in a band or an artist and the rights owners. And it grows every single month. We have 3,600 digital service providers who pay this performance license. It's a very specific license, which I'll kind of dive into here shortly. Um, and then kind of like what they were asking about neighboring rights, we have partnerships in over 50 countries to collect pro performance royalties overseas. And that makes it super simplistic for a lot of people that are really trying to collect royalties in very specific territories or just around the world in general. Um, next slide, please. So we're, what we're going to do is we're going to start off with kind of what Steve was saying. You know, we are very specific and, and uh, Symphonic is very specific about what, what we're doing here. And we're really working on the sound recording side. So just to break it down, there are two copyrights that exist with every song that is created and recorded. Um, when it's recorded, um, you obviously have the underlying music. So the song uh, writing, the, the songwriter and the publisher, you have the, uh, the underlying uh, notes and lyrics. But then when you record it and it makes a permanent fixation of sounds, you have that master and then you have the performance from that artist. Um, and so th there's two different sides. And so sound exchange really sits on the sound recording side. So if you're an artist, if you work with artists, if you're a manager or your label, we're very specifically talking to you about this. 
Um, so as far as making it like a clear example, uh, everybody knows the song Respect, made, made very famous by Aretha Franklin, um, written by Otis Redding. So obviously Otis Redding would own the musical copyright um, uh, as far as the notes and the lyrics as a songwriter and obviously as the publisher. Um, on the sound recording side, Aretha Franklin would be actually be the artist that would be featured in this. So Aretha would be the one that signs up with Sound Exchange as the performer, and then her label would also sign up to claim their ownership as the master owner as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so who administers the performance right? Um, so again, kind of this left right side on the musical composition side, this is a very familiar territory for a lot of people. Um, you're talking about the songwriter and the publisher side. So you work directly with ASCAP or CSAC or BMI or GMR. On the sound recording side, again, we were uh, the nonprofit created by Congress to collect and distribute this digital performance license. So Sound Exchange is the entity in the United States that you would work with as the performer and as the right zone, the copyright uh, holder of the of the master um, to sign up and uh, just to receive your royalty direct through us. Um, so Sound Exchange pays royalties for these featured artists and the sound recording copyright owners. Where does it come from? So it's very specific, uh, but it is actually really pretty lucrative when, when you start getting into this. Um, so it's satellite radio, internet radio, and cable TV radio. Um, the very, you know, very specific ones I would say are Sirius XM, Pandora, Music Choice, iHeartRadio, if it's streamed over the internet, not in your car, which is terrestrial radio, which I will talk about later in our advocacy part of this. Um, but we are not able to collect from YouTube, Apple Music, Spotify, SoundCloud, because it's not non-interactive digital radio. You are still able to select your song or select next or skip or anything like that. So anything essentially that you can't do that on, that's where this digital performance license would come into play for your performer and for the master rights owner. Um, <clears throat> as far as a breakdown, so how it works, and I'll kind of break this down in parts here. In the top right, you can see where a sound recording is used. The royalties are collected by sound exchange from that digital perform uh, that digital um, partner of ours. And then through our portal, which we're gonna show you how to use that, um, it is distributed to the artist and the musician and the copyright holder. And that's just what, why you need to register and why you need to go in and claim your songs. Um, the breakdown at the bottom right, says the split 50% goes to the sound recorded copyright owner. So it could be the artist themselves if they are independent. It could also be a record label. It could be an investor or anything like that. But mainly, um, and, and then uh, the 45% would go to the directly to the featured artist. So the band, the performer, um, the duo, they would sign up and they would receive that. 5% goes to the non-featured artist with the SAG after fund, which is a um, congressional um, rule that we are required to do. But knowing this, um, featured artists that own their own recordings that are our, that are independent artists can keep up to 95% of everything that they make. And when you really think about that and kind of what Steve was saying before, you have to be aware of you know what your ownership stake is, who's the performer, who's the featured performer, um, and because there are multiple sides to this. So it's important to to note that. Um, some some artists, don't remember that they are the master owner and they need to collect on their behalf. And then on the flip side of that, a lot of, um, you know, maybe uh, rights owners assume that performers are collecting when they might not be. So it's important to make sure that you're collecting both of those sides and you know, who's, who's collecting on that behalf. Um, yeah, this I think is a great just, section to also oh. mention that if you do have an agreement, you know, with Symphonic as your distributor and you're receiving sound exchange royalties through Symphonic, understanding that that 50% is what Symphonic is collecting and distributing to you. Understanding that there's still that 45% that you have to claim directly as an artist is where sometimes that confusion lies because, you know, most artists and rights owners think, oh, you know, my distributor is collecting my sound exchange royalties, so I don't have to worry about it. So understanding that Symphonic can only collect that sound recording copyright owner piece, um, which is great. And if, you know, you want them to handle that admin, perfect. But don't forget that if you're the featured artist, you have to register directly to claim that 45%. Right. And I think no third parties are supposed to be able to do that for you. The That's absolutely right, Steve. Artist um, does it themselves. 
yes, we have to pay the performer directly as an individual or to a company that they wholly own. Uh, let me let me jump in here and say that if anybody has questions, please put them in a Q and A, uh, and we'll get to those after the presentation. Thanks. And that brings us to registration. Um, so how do you actually get set up with Sound Exchange? How do you make sure you're collecting what you should be through us? Um, and so you can access our registration online through our website. Um, it's pretty easy. We also offer it in Spanish um, with the hope that we'll be able to offer it in more languages in the future. Um, this is not the page that you would use to update an existing account. Um, also, for those that might need to register on behalf of a deceased performer, we require specific air and estate paperwork for that, which if you click that button on that page, you can send us your information so we can get you that package. But if it's just a straightforward registration, you'll go through this link, which you can find on our website, and you're going to kind of choose what path of the registration you're going through. So are you registering yourself? or on behalf of someone else. So if you're a performer, perhaps you have a manager who's registering on your behalf, that would be a situation where you know the manager is registering you, so someone else. Um, the main difference being sound exchange requires an authorization form, if um, that is the case, where the performer or performers who make up, um, let's say a band, are actually signing off to authorize that representative to um, complete this registration for them. So you're going to be choosing whether your profile is just as a performer, as a sound recording copyright owner, or both. Um, and you should really think of our registration as setting up your payment place and how you want to get paid. Um, as you know, Steve mentioned, um, if you're registering as a performer, it is a strict policy of sound exchange that um, the payment is going to you directly as an individual or to a company that you wholly own. Um, and then you'll also be choosing a payment method. Um, if you choose a physical check in the mail that's distributed quarterly through Sound Exchange, March, June, September, and December are our distributions. If you're choosing our other payment methods, which include direct deposit or international direct deposit, we also offer PayPal, Venmo, Zelle, um, and Cash App, I believe. So those are new payment methods that we're really excited to roll out. And those are all going to be distributed on a monthly basis if you reach our minimum threshold for a payment. Um, so you'll think about, you know, setting up your payment place. You're not going to actually be claiming recordings as part of this registration process, but letting us know what profiles you're creating, how you want to get paid, what your payment method is um, in order for us to set you up. Once you submit that registration, it's going to roll into our membership step. Now, you do not need to be a member of Sound Exchange in order to get paid for U.S. domestic royalty collection. So that's kind of an important distinction to make. If you are just registered with Sound Exchange, then you are collecting U.S. domestic royalties. I also want to mention that Sound Exchange has the lowest um, admin rate domestically in the world for the collection and distribution of these royalties. If you take an additional step to become a member with Sound Exchange, um, you're signing a membership agreement that's coupled with our international mandate. So the main benefit of becoming a member with Sound Exchange is that you can authorize us to collect international royalties on your behalf as well. Sound Exchange is a fantastic option for like kind of a one-stop shop to collect your neighboring rights. Um, some of the great things about Sound Exchange is we do have um, an extremely competitive admin rate on our international royalty collection. Um, we also don't lock you into any term agreements. You can expand or limit your mandate whenever you'd like. Um, you know, you can find a full list of all the territories that we do have agreements in place with. Essentially, we have reciprocal agreements with other collection management organizations around the world. They'll collect for our artists and rights owners, we'll collect for theirs, and we kind of swap the money. Um, so again, you can find a full list of kind of all the territories we cover, and if it's performer agreements, rights owner agreements, or both. Um, you know, each CMO has kind of a different distribution schedule. Sound Exchange tries to collect um, as often and pay out as often as we can based on when those um, royalties are sent through us. Um, it's important that we have, you know, uh, some crucial pieces of information when you register in order to effectively claim you internationally. Um, but, you know, Sound Exchange, again, we pay monthly and directly. 
And um, we give you that freedom and flexibility if you do do international collection through us. And like I said, you can expand um, or limit your mandate at any point with us. So it's a great option um, for international royalty collection. Um, we also like to discuss letters of direction, which are usually um, something we get a lot of questions about. Um, for those who don't know, a letter of direction is used for a featured performer to allocate a percentage of their royalty to a creative participant on a recording. So a creative participant is defined as a producer, a mixer, or an engineer. Um, and basically that producer, mixer, engineer can't receive royalties from sound exchange without this letter of direction. They also don't register directly with sound exchange. We use this letter of direction that is signed by the artist to create an account on behalf of that creative participant. Um, and, you know, this letter of direction can be applied retroactively as, a, as of a certain date moving forward. Um, but it does have to be signed by the artist as it's their featured performer portion that they're allocating to this producer, mixer, engineer. Um, if you're dealing with a recording that has multiple featured performers on it, um, like a collaboration, um, basically each artist will need to sign off on that letter of direction in order for that creative participant to receive a percentage on the full artist share of the recording. If, if, three artists are on the recording and they're each collecting 33% of the artist share. If only one artist signs the letter of direction, let's say to a producer for 10%, the producer is only going to get 10% of their 33%. In order to get 10% of the full 100% of the artist portion, all three artists would need to sign off on it. So we just recommend making sure you have our most up-to-date um, letter of direction forms um, and getting those kind of signed as soon as possible. We do know it can be challenging to go back retroactively to get signatures. So just ensuring that you have those up-to-date forms and you get them signed kind of at the top. We we say before you even turn the lights on in the studio, if you're a producer, mixture engineer, you should have them sign off on that paperwork um, from the jump. So, okay, so once you submit your registration with Sound Exchange and choose whether you want to become a member um, and submit an international mandate, um, you're going to be able to get access to our online portal called SX Direct. Um, this is our 24 seven self service portal. This is where you're going to view your statements, um, be able to edit your payment information. Um, this is where you're going to be able to claim your recordings, you know, a whole host of all the tools that we're able to offer. But as far as who has access to this portal, so every account has one primary contact on that account. So if you're registering on your behalf, it's going to be your contact information. If you are authorizing someone else to register on your behalf, odds are they're using their contact information as the primary. So whatever email address is used in that registration process as the primary contact, that's whose email is going to be tied to the login for that account in our portal. Now, while there can be only one primary contact, um, there can be multiple guests on an account. So the main difference between a primary and a guest is that the primary has the ability to edit payment information. Um, a guest does not have that ability, but um, when a guest is added in the portal, in case you know people want their own login through their own email address, um, that primary or performer who adds someone to their account will choose what kind of privileges they have. Um, they can choose whether it's a view only privilege. So basically look, but don't touch or view with repertoire. And that means that you can assist with um, claiming recordings on behalf and making sure that the catalog is organized and everything is you know where it should be. So you can instantly add guests in the portal. We make it very easy um, so that if multiple people need access and you know that way not everyone needs to log into the same email address, um, you can definitely do that right in the portal. Once you are logged in, any um, account that your email address is associated with will show up in your dashboard. Um, and basically we want to make sure we have the best information on file. So if you have a performer profile, um, when we say performer, we're, we're uh, basically meaning your legal name. So not your artist name or your alias that you're recording under. Performer is the legal name. So if, if you have registered on behalf of a band paying out to a company or LLC that the band wholly owns, we're going to need each performer's name who makes up that band entity. Um, 
And we're also going to need information like birthday um, in order to distinguish between multiple performers that might have the same name. Um, and that's crucial because um, for international royalty collection, we need to know which performer we're collecting for. We're not able to just say like, hey, PPL in the UK, you know, send us everything you have for the Beatles. We have to say, hey, can you send us what you have for Paul McCartney? Can you send us what you have for Ringo Starr? So we need to have accurate information on file in order to do that. And we make it very easy in the portal for you to make sure that information is accurate, up to date. And if, you know, you make the decision to register with Sound Exchange and not become a member, there's always an option for you to enroll as a member here and edit your mandate. And that's all on that kind of main dashboard where the performer information lives. The star of the show of our portal, though, I would really say is our search and claim tool. Um, most people think that once you're registered, you're done, you're good. You should be able to receive your royalties. But like I said, registration is really about setting up the payment place. You didn't have to claim any recordings through that process. This is how you make sure that you get paid for what you're featured on or what you, you know, which sound recordings that you own. So search and claim allows you to search our entire database of recordings that have either been reported as streamed by the licensees um, that use our compulsory license or information, you know, submitted like the metadata directly from your distributor or from your label. Um, and so you're able to search by title, artist, ISRC code or album, um, any recordings um, that you want to claim as an artist or as a rights owner, you're going to do the search. We pull back results based on your search criteria, but it is kind of a wild card search. So, you know, you might have like a thousand pages show up, but perhaps only the first or two pages are really recordings that are yours. So you're going to click through all the recordings that you know are yours, add them to the cart, let us know what percentage you're claiming and submit those claims. Um, You'll know that those recordings that you've claimed have been processed because if you were to go back in search and claim and search for those same recordings, you shouldn't see them come up in search and claim. Um, these are only for unassociated recordings um, for the account that you're logged in under. Anything that is already linked to your account for payment is going to show up in your associated recordings. Um, there's a My Catalog section of the portal, which is where search and claim sits, and that's where associated recording sits. So if you look at your associated recordings, you're able to see how many recordings are currently associated and linked for payment. You can click on that to drill down if you need to see exactly which ones. And then you're going to go check search and claim always. I would recommend maybe on a quarterly basis to make sure that there's no recordings falling through those cracks. Um, unfortunately, I'm sure many of you know metadata is one of the largest challenges we face as an industry. Um, and so, you know, sometimes the quality of metadata that gets reported to us from our licensees is not in great shape. There can be misspellings, there can be missing pieces of information. And so sometimes um, recordings do fall through the cracks and don't you know, match the right way because again, a misspelling or a variation. So we just ask that you use that search and claim tool um, at least once a year to make sure that um, nothing is falling through the cracks and everything's linked to your account as it should be. Um, then obviously your statements are going to show you what is actually, um, you know, getting streams and paying out. Um, and, you know, your statement provides a track by track breakdown, all the revenue associated with each recording, as well as a list of the services that are streaming. Now, the main difference between search and claim for performers versus rights owners is that in addition to the percentage that you're claiming, we're also going to ask for the date range. So um, obviously a performer on a particular recording is never going to change, um, but we do know that recordings can be bought, sold, licensed. So we do ask for that particular information if you are claiming on the rights owner side. Um, we also do offer um, for sound recording copyright owners to submit metadata directly to us. Um, sound Exchange actually prefers that because we're able to require certain pieces of metadata like the ISRC code or that unique identifying number for a particular sound recording. Um, that is not necessarily provided by the licensee when they submit metadata for what they've streamed. So we do have that option for you to, you know, maybe you're just submitting one or two releases at a time, or we do have a bulk upload feature um, for you to submit the metadata for your full catalog, as well as the percentage you're claiming for those recordings. 
We also have an overlaps and disputes process for anything that does end up in overlap between multiple claimants. Um, and Sound Exchange has a pretty robust system right now for rights owners in our portal that will show you if any other claimant has made a claim on the recording you're trying to claim. We'll let you know if it's a percentage issue, if it's a date range issue. Um, and then we give you the option to either relinquish your claim, perhaps you made a mistake, edit it if maybe the percentage or date range was wrong, or maintain as is. Um, and then if the claimants both maintain that overlapping claim, it will move to that dispute stage where we'll place the recording on hold and provide contact information for all the claimants so that they can come to an agreement together and let Sound Exchange know how it should pay out. Um, so we do provide weekly reminders if you do have any recordings that happen to be in overlap or dispute so that you know. Um, on the artist side, we aren't currently able to offer this in the portal, but we do have an artist resolution team that is reaching out to claimants um, to do the work on any overlaps or disputes on the artist side. We also just wanted to mention that we do have an app. So if you're you know, interested in getting your statement on your phone, on the road, um, or making claims, like, you know, please know that we do have an app. It is something that you're able to use and be able to kind of um, track your sound exchange when you're not in front of your laptop. Yes. Um, and now that we're all registered and we're all claimed because everybody's got perfect data now, and I love it. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about advocacy, and this will be kind of our last topic before we jump into questions and Q&A. But just to kind of give you, again, you guys a little bit of background, um, you know, obviously, as creators and as an industry, we are really trying to make sure that we are at the forefront of what the next piece of technology is, or how, how do we keep growing this, this creator pool, essentially. And so Sound Exchange is really sitting at the center of that, they're at the, the top of the Music First Coalition. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about the American Music Fairness Act. Um, so uh, essentially, the, the idea behind the Music Fairness Act uh, is that we believe that there should be a sound recording performance right for terrestrial radio broadcast. This is a right that 95% of countries around the world already have. And I know I'm like laughing saying that, but it is a, a really big oversight if you ask a lot of us. Um, but uh, we, we, the U United States in this instance is really sitting on a really bad list of, uh, I think it's Russia, Iran, uh, North Korea, Iraq, and the United States are the only countries that do not have this right for their creators in, in, the, way that, um, in the way that we would like. And so obviously we do a lot of different things for creators that, that maybe those countries might not, but this is a clear oversight and a clear, a clear opportunity for um, performers to, to be paid for these, these royalties uh, on their behalf. And again, this is something that as, as Sound Exchange, we, we see at work in this non-interactive digital satellite uh, radio area. Um, we think we could totally be a part of that from the terrestrial radio as well. So um, it, it, it exempts small market and um, non-commercial stations because you know obviously we don't want to uh, put them out of business. It also protects songwriters and publishers with the way it was written. So I would implore anybody to check that out. Um, that's something that is a big part of what we're talking through. Um, also, Sound Exchange is a big part of the Copyright Royalty Board conversations. We are actively there um, speaking on all creators' behalf, um, as well as the, uh, the recording industry. And then just real quick about national treatment. Uh, we support national treatment for creators, basically saying that music creators should be treated the same regardless of their nation nationality. Um, unfortunately, not everywhere believes that. Not everyone believes that. And so uh, going back to the American Music Fairness Act, because we don't pay um, artists for terrestrial radio airplay um, in this instance, uh, we, we as Americans would not receive that right in those other countries either. And so we estimate up to $300 million every year that gets left on the table of American um, artists and creator money um, just because we don't have that right. And so it's an important piece that I, I wanted to just highlight for everybody here um, that, that sharing your experiences as a creator and using your voice when you can and talking with leaders locally or on a national level is is such a, an honor and i've really enjoyed trying to you know talk um talk through this stuff but at the end of the day it's really helpful when our creators can can speak to it and you know basically show hey i, mean, I might have a hundred thousand followers but that doesn't mean much and i can show you why and those are the things that are a little bit different um about our industry than others um but yeah and then i guess at this point we can uh i see steve's back so take a few questions and here's more from the Q and A. I saw some questions pop up there too. 
Yeah, thank you guys. Great presentation. And uh, yeah, we wanted to reiterate that that we really admire what Sound Exchange does as far as advocacy in, in DC and Linda and those folks. Are, they're really, you know, they're hassling the, the Congress to to make these changes. And, and we want to give you a lot of respect for that because there do need to be some changes made in how creators and musicians are paid in this country. Um, Absolutely, man. Absolutely. So Symphonic can deliver your content to Sound Exchange or the neighboring rights uh, RO with the international mandate. If, you, if you're a Symphonic client, just want to put that out there. <clears throat> the advantage is ease of use. We don't want to prevent anyone from doing it on their own if, if that's what you want to do. Um, it's a great organization any way you get there. Um, one of the advantages is we'll help you uh, mitigate any conflicts, ownership conflicts like TR was talking about there. We can help with that. And uh, you can also deliver your content to Sound Exchange uh, via Symphonic the same way you would deliver to any other DSP. So you would, you know, we would add it as a DSP to your account. And when your when your releases come out, then it would be, uh, you know, simultaneously be delivered to Sound Exchange. So there's an ease of use factor there too, as well as uh, us having the the uh, international mandate if you if you want it. Um, that's already set up as well. So just want to put that out there. And I think we can proceed to the Q&A. Yeah. Um, I can kind of start scrolling through here. Um, someone asks, can a label represent or collect for an artist for their 45% with written documentation? Um, the answer is no. Like, again, the registration, the payment for the performer side has to be in the name of the artist or a company that that performer wholly owns. It can't even be a company that they share with their spouse, okay? So like, it's pretty strict. Um, it has to be in the name of the performer or performers if it's a band. Um, there is a like in care of option if you need a check sent to a certain location, but the check would have to be in the name of that performer or their company. If, can I ask an, an extra question there? Um, is it is the artist side monetizing, in fact, the performance itself uh, rather than the sound recording copyright? Is that what we're we're seeing happen there? Are they monetizing the performer side? I'm trying to like from a rights perspective, is you know the artist side? Is it their performance in the abstract that is being monetized, yes. or is it, okay? Yes. So like in Mark's example of like Otis Redding and Aretha Franklin. So Otis Redding writes the song, he publishes it, he composes, you know, the music, the lyrics, he puts it down, but then Aretha records it and it's her version that becomes really popular and is the one played on multiple stations. Sound Exchange is paying Aretha Franklin every time her version is streamed. And so as the performer of that particular iteration of that recording, she is earning 45% as the featured performer um, when streamed through cable internet or satellite radio. Right. If they're using and, her. and that is mandatory as, as sound exchange is set up to, yes. to grab that performance. Yes. That's correct. Uh, and I'll just add to that real fast. Um, I actually feel like that's definitely more of a feature than a bug. Um, there's there's a lot of parts about the industry that don't pay artists directly or get to them much later. This is not one of those. And as a, again, coming from the manager side, this was really our way of um, knowing that every month we could receive a payment, assuming that we were getting airplay, right? Um, and you hit the threshold, I think it's $10. Um, but on a monthly, a monthly, um, you know, deposit, direct deposit, it's such a, a great feature for an artist to be able to receive that royalty directly. And that's why I think it's, it's more of a feature than a bug in, in this instance. Um, but yeah. <clears throat> yeah. To that point, it's one of the few places in the industry that pay the artist directly, you know, regardless of what's kind of maybe happening with their label or the rights owner. Um, so yeah, well said, Mark. Um, Someone asked if you're the songwriter and performer, can they register on your website for both? Um, so as a reminder, writing, publishing, composing is going to be handled through ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, GMR. Sound Exchange is covering featured performance and ownership of the sound recording. So you would not register with Sound Exchange as a songwriter um, 
only as the featured performer and if you own the particular version of the recording. Um, someone asked um, what percentage of the 45 goes to Sound Exchange. So Sound Exchange is nonprofit. Um, like I said, we have a general admin cost that is the lowest in the world. Um, I believe it hovers uh, around five or six percent. It depends on the year. Um, but that's taken off the top from the licensees who are um, utilizing our license. Um, and then it's allocated and distributed based on the reports apply. So that's the answer to that question. Um, someone asked what we consider a company the artist personally owns. Well, I can take this one. Um, so, so the idea again is, you know, you could pay, pay the artist, you know, straight up with their name again, for me, a check to Mark Rucker, uh, send it anytime. No, I'm kidding. Um, but, uh, but yes, yeah, so we would have that or a lot of artists for tax purposes or bands. If there, if there's like a group account, usually have an LLC set up or, a, or a corp or an S corp. And that, that could be obviously beneficial for different reasons for them, taxes or otherwise, um, but that's what we mean by a company that they either wholly own or are a part owner of as, a, as essentially as a band member. Um, that's what we could send that to. Um, someone asked, if there's a featured artist who appears on a track with a primary artist, can they submit for their own percentage directly through sound exchange or does it have to be through an LOD? So that's a great question. Um, again, Letters of direction are only for producers, mixers, or engineers. If we're talking multiple featured artists, um, so again, like more of a collaboration recording, um, yes, that featured performer can register directly and claim their percentage. Typically, when Sound Exchange has a collaboration come through, we split it evenly amongst the featured artists who are reported in the artist field, unless told otherwise. So if let's say, um, let's say there's two artists, um, we would assume it's 50-50 unless the artists say, oh no, actually we have an agreement that it's 80-20. And we would confirm like, okay, we were told it's 80-20, is that correct? The claimants are like, yep, that's our agreement, great. And that's how we would split it. Um, so if you are featured on the recording, then yes, you are absolutely able to register directly and claim your percentage. Um, the letter of direction is specifically for producers, mixers, or engineers. Okay. Oh, I feel like we're flying through these questions. I love it. Um, and thank you guys for these. Uh, they, they, I, I mean, you might feel like they're nuanced or something, but for us, this is so helpful to kind of talk through and maybe give you guys some good examples. <clears throat> um, a question here: If Sound Exchange doesn't collect performance royalties from DSPs, then what's the entity in charge of collecting royalties from interactive streaming? A follow-up to this above, what about non-interactive streaming on DSPs like Spotify Radio? Does Sound Exchange collect royalties from that? That's a great question. So the answer is you would that a lot of the DSPs have direct licenses with the distributors. Unfortunately, as far as Spotify Radio goes or any, any kind of radio in an interactive streaming space, it sits in this gray area of the license that we that we that we don't um that we that we don't represent, unfortunately. Um, and so that would actually go through your distributor. Um, and they would have a direct license there. However, on the copyright side, as far as songwriting and and um, publishing, there um, there are other entities that that would be collecting on the mechanicals of that. So um, again, you would want to work with your PRO um, to to work on that. But unfortunately, there isn't a digital performance license uh, for us to uh, represent on on Spotify or YouTube or uh, anything like that. I, I would jump in and say that Spotify Radio has become basically a playlist that's auto generated. So it is interactive in that you can skip a song you don't like and you cannot do that on say Sirius XM. Yeah. So it's probably covered by whatever deal your distributor has with uh, Spotify. Yeah, or label. And again, there's, there's no guarantee that the artist is seeing royalties through that direct license. Sound exchange guarantees that the artist is being paid directly for their percentage and that breakdown we provided by all means like if your label is you know in a direct license and receives the royalties to spotify they can be you know paying out to artists but there's no guarantee and we don't know what the transparency of that is again you're going to get a statement directly from sound exchange um 
through our license and what you're getting paid for and where you're being played. And, um, you know, that's part of too, like with our portal, we want to be incredibly transparent about, you know, where your recordings are being played um, and providing you with as much information as we have. Okay. Okay. Someone asked if two parties cannot come to an agreement with a dispute or conflict, what happens to the collection moving forward? So unfortunately, when an overlap moves to dispute at that, at that stage, sound exchange places the recording on hold. So no royalties pay out until the parties can come to an agreement. Um, Sound exchange doesn't interpret contracts and agreements internally. That is not something we do. So it could look like you pursuing legal action outside of sound exchange and doing whatever you need to do. Sound exchange can, in that case, like help provide accounting and things um, if it gets to that stage. Um, but we do not get directly involved um, in that sense. But once you come to an agreement and then come to us and say, okay, this is what we've agreed on and we hear both claimants are good, then we can take the recording off hold, make any adjustments, any debits or credits that need to happen and resume payment. Um, otherwise, unfortunately, if you cannot come to an agreement, um, it could potentially just remain on hold, at least on the sound recording copyright owner side, if that's where the dispute lies. Um, another question here. Uh, so when Aretha performs, I'm guessing respect, and when she performs it, do you require evidence that the songwriter and music composer gave her permission to perform it? And does her uh, does the songwriter and music composer get paid a percentage? So again, we really only work with the sound recording copyright side and the performer side. So in this instance, we don't require any evidence for you know them to be able to record the song. That's something that another entity or another right would come up um, again as a, as a creator. We, we, you know, we have, we actually work with a lot of um, artists that put up a bunch of covers or, or something like that. And that is, that is not something that we would require any additional um, licenses or anything permission from that, but you would have to get that from other sides of as to how you would record it, whether it's a blanket license or a mechanical license from there, that would not be a sound exchange uh, feature. Um, and does the sound songwriter and music composer get paid a percentage? So again, that that percentage that what they would make would come from a different entity. We are very specific to the performer of the song, of the sound recording, and the the owner of that master sound recording. But like the same way that cover could get reported to us, and we're paying that artist who covered it. The hope is that BMI, ASCAP, CSAC, or GMR is paying the songwriter and composer. You know when that recording is being played and they cover more than just the non-interactive digital space. Um, someone asked, can there be an LOD for musicians? So Mark had mentioned that 5% of every recording at sound exchange gets sent to the AFM sag after fund. That fund is specifically for non-featured um, performers, for session musicians, for background vocalists. Um, so I highly recommend that if you fall into that category, that you register directly with AFM and sag -AFTRA for that fund. They have their own distribution process um, to those performers and musicians and how they do it. Um, sound exchange is just required by law to send that percentage um, for that group of folks to AFM and sag -AFTRA. So um, one of those buttons when I showed the online registration will actually link if you're a session musician um, or vocalist so that you can access their website and find out how to register with them directly. Someone also asked how frequently do you get statements once registered? So there's a couple layers to that. Um, as I mentioned, when you select your payment method, um, physical checks are quarterly. Um, our other payment methods like direct deposit or um, like I said, Zelle, PayPal, Cash App, those are monthly, but we do have a minimum threshold in order to send out a payment. Um, it is, I believe, $100 um, throughout the year, but Q4, we drop it to $10. Um, so if you haven't reached that minimum threshold, your account will keep earning until you do meet that threshold, and then we'll send out your payment as soon as you meet it. And the statement will account for any time that has gone by and when those earnings have come in. Um, so depending on what payment method you're set up for and how much you've actually earned, that will affect how frequently you get your statements. Um, 
But if, you know, you ever need like an earnings report or one of the new features we've launched in our SX Direct portal is if you perhaps have a negative balance, we also show you that. Sometimes there can be um, an overlap or dispute issue where perhaps you did, you know, incorrectly claim a recording and we had to make the adjustment and you had been paid out a certain amount that might um, result in a debit um, or, you know, perhaps an adjustment was made on the artist side or an LOD was applied um, that you had already paid out on that was retroactive. And so we had to make debits and credits to adjust um, that could perhaps lead to a negative balance. So we'll show you what that balance is. Um, and then again, your statement will account for um, all of that information once you resume payments. Okay, let's see if anything's left. Um, someone asked to clarify about international royalties. So, and whether it's on the performer side or the rights owner side. Um, it depends on the territory. Again, we have a full list on our website of the territories in which we have um, agreements in, and it will show you if it's the performer side, the sound recording copyright owner side, or both. Um, so you can view that list online. Yes. Um, Man, I love this. this. is actually like really fun. We've I, I don't think I've done a Q&A like this before, and it's really fun to go through them all. <clears throat> I'm going to ask if you register under your artist name, or does it have to be your government name only for payment purposes? Um, so part of what, part of our registration process, if, if you don't want taxes withheld, is also submitting a tax form. So your legal name is also kind of matched to you know, the potential tax form that you're submitting to reduce withholding. If it's a company you're submitting, you know, on behalf of the company, um, and so it would have to be under your legal name. We won't accept the payment going to your artist name. The artist name or alias is really only for the recordings. And when you're claiming the recordings, that should be linked to your account. Um, but we need to have your government name in order to pay you. And we require um, a government-issued photo ID, um, which, again, you can... Well, not again, but you can black out sensitive information about that. You can also provide a notarized um letter confirming your identity if you're uncomfortable sharing that information but there are pieces of information we require in order to verify your account and be able to pay you um that is audit compliant and that you know is essentially preventing someone from fraudulently claiming on your behalf so to answer your question we will need you know your government name or your company because that's some of the requirements um, of the registration process Um, question here at the end how do you find where songs are being played to get the money to the performer um so again we have over 3600 digital service providers that provide us with their playlist playlisting and what they've played and they have provided us a certain amount of information that we can connect to your guys's registered accounts and claim songs so they would be paying this royalty to us and they would be telling us what we're what they're playing and then we're able to connect that with you guys directly yeah, and Sound Exchange also has like a licensing enforcement department. So if we don't feel like we are, you know, receiving those reports of play or receiving the royalties that they're required for using our license, you know, our licensing enforcement department will step in and do what they can to try and make sure we are getting, you know, what we're supposed to be getting from that service that's using our license so that we're able to pay these performers and rights owners, um, you know, accordingly. Um. Let's see. Someone asked, if I don't earn enough to meet the threshold within the three-year retroactive period, do I lose anything? The answer is no. You're going to keep accumulating until you meet that threshold. As long as the recordings are claimed, you won't lose out on that money. Correct. And that key part, as long as they're claimed. Um, again, uh, just to highlight that point, our, we're, we're retroactive up to three years. Um, so it is important to make sure that you are registered and claimed and you can claim up to the previous three years. Yep. Someone asked if um, 
let's just say if you have any questions, so part of this QR code on the screen will, you know, link to some helpful information that Mark and I have covered today, but it also has information for our industry relations team that includes Mark and I at the bottom. So if you all have any other questions, if you need assistance with sound exchange, please feel free to reach out. We're happy to be your contact here. We want to be here to help. We want to make this as easy as possible. We want to help you maximize your royalty collection, you know, the best that we can. So please, you know, utilize that. Make sure you have our information um, and feel free to reach out. And even, I, I won't volunteer you, Mark, but feel free to pass along my contact information as well if you know um, someone needs help with sound exchange and we are happy to do so. Absolutely. Thanks everybody for attending. Thanks so much. Uh, we're happy to have these kind of industry powwows and uh, you know we're gonna keep doing it with various other DSPs. Special thanks to Tiara and and uh, Mark. And uh, we, if, if you have any other questions Symphonic related, feel free to hit us up um, via the help desk. Um, so thank you for coming and we'll see you soon. Thanks again Thank for having you. us, Steve. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.